worked through myself like uh, for uh, uh, for that, but just maybe to give a, a slight background because there's a word citizen science uh, in obviously citizen science of, of contemplation. And maybe I'll just wanted to, to share, if you can see my screen, just a few slides to give the background uh, on my end around this, it's citizen science and what we call also extreme citizen science. And after that, uh, Liam can take over on uh, his side, I'm sorry, um, uh, on his side, maybe uh, but the contemplative part. Uh, <clears throat> so on my end, I come from the background of uh, using network tools to understand like research communities and especially research communities in contexts that are not academic, that tend to be open context, fraud science, citizen science. Um, it's context that uh, we've seen in different communities. We've seen that it's patient communities, for example, uh, we've seen that with the, the technological communities, makers. So there's like many different uh, contexts, like like at LPI, for example, they're also working with teachers in schools that make their own self-research on how they teach at school. It's called teachers as researchers. So there's all these communities that have appeared, right? And, and it's incredible. Like there's stakeholders and they're asking the question about what they're doing. Uh, and they get empowered and super, you know, interested to, to understand better, especially when you look at patient communities. It's a very good example. And it's begun, it's, it's, it's been an object of study now. Uh, uh, it's been called crowd science, network science, massively collaborative science. Uh, and it's, it's touched like virtually almost any field. So like astronomy, biology, I, I know Wolfgang was at CERN before. So they have also like this incredible like idea square as well. Like they have involved, you know, and, and obviously like they have many different activities around that. Uh, yeah, in, in, in many different fields. Uh, and in general, it tends to be uh, characterized this, this ecosystem by being open on both uh, participation level, so anybody, all stakeholders are welcome to participate, uh, irrespective in a way of what they're skilled at, um, and that there is an openness in the dissemination of the output as well, right? Uh, and this is uh, something we've seen, even people solve mathematical theorems, like for example, the polymath community collectively, right? So this is kind of, um, I would say, something that in the traditional science world, at least, has been a movement uh, and that has had results. Uh, I'm showing an example here of, I've been interested particularly in this big self-organized communities that suddenly, you know, create their own projects and, and, and coordinate those different projects, find their own funding and do like micro funding to fund what they think is interesting. It's basically ecosystem where people give power back to the project and to the project holder to kind of organize and, and, and drive a uh, uh, research program that they want to do, right? So it's really based from the ground up. Uh, and so we've published a paper, something interesting on that is that you want participation. And it's, it's something you don't think usually in science, in science you think of outcomes of, 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 of results, but the thing that you never think about the way people have to participate. How do you align people? How do you, you know, find, a, 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 uh, um, uh, 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 collaboration synergies, uh, how do you define uh, uh, questions in a way that integrate all perspectives, all right? So it's not just about the fact that there is one reality, it's about that we all have perspectives and we need together to find ways to elaborate a sense making of that in order to kind of go further into the inquiry. Uh, and one label that has been put on this kind of very high-end participatory involvement has been called extreme citizen science. Uh, he's someone, uh, uh, Muki Hakle, who has developed this uh, term. He's actually at the Learning Planet Institute now, uh, uh, where Gail is and where uh, I'm a, a fellow uh, since uh, 2018. Uh, it's extreme citizen science is a context where citizen science traditionally was thought as people, you know, giving a bit of their phone battery <laughs> or like <laughs> screen saver time to kind of find extraterrestrial life or things like that. So it's like citizens that sensors. And there's a ladder where you can go more and more of having people go into the interpretation of findings, like with Galaxy Zoo, for example, that was interpreting what you're saying, uh, or even participating in, to ask questions. How do you set the problem? How do you collect the data? Up to the extreme case where it's like actually a co-researcher. So they also have, a, like they know what their problem is uh, and, and they know better what how to solve it. So that's an example 
for geographists, there's an example, for example, uh, in going to Congo and working with pygmies who actually know <laughs> what they need to track <laughs> in the jungle because they are stakeholders and they know that landscape better uh, than would be Western scientists uh, who are in Europe and you know don't have necessarily the embodied knowledge of that landscape. Uh, and so maybe, you know what, so, so basically that, that, that's, that's the framing. So now what I'll do is that I'll give uh, the hand to Liam who can continue and, and, and present the framing in the context of uh, contemplatives. Uh, and uh, Liam, the floor is yours. And you're muted by the way. I said, um, yeah, so I think, great. I, I'll probably just remain a talking head because we've started sort of late and I'll be uh, compressing my presentation in real time. So I think what I'll do is just kind of uh, work for my slides uh, and tell you a bit about, okay. So first of all, I didn't really introduce myself during the beginning. I'm also co-founder of Life Itself. Background in cognitive science, I've been, um, I guess I interested in contemplative practice for over 20 years. Um, I didn't formally study it as a during my PhD, but um, I'm very like familiar with the, the questions around that field uh, quite a bit, uh, both because of events uh, during and since my PhD. Um, so, Question is like, you know, for the, for facing contemplative citizen science, and this is what we're talking about what Mark was 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 a, an extreme version of, of of citizen science where we're really getting the contemplative community involved in the scientific process. So I, I think this is very important. I'm gonna kind of make the case for it. I think I'll I'm gonna start though um with a really why would you think that? Well, you know. One thing would be like my current job actually is is co-director of something called the Climate Majority Project, uh, which is a uh, effort to get um, climate action into the mainstream. Uh, it's right now kind of dominated by a uh, progressive, in, it's basically caught in the progressive bubble and we're working to get it outside the mainstream. I'm uh, very much spend all of my time uh, a, a huge percentage of that climate. And um, we just crossed the boundary uh, for uh, the first time ever that surface temperatures of the earth were over 1.5 degrees C, greater, uh, greater than historical average uh, the first week of, of July. Um, that, you know, 94% of, of climate scientists privately think in, in anonymous polls that we're not going to make the 1.5 boundary. Uh, so in many ways, institutionally, we've already failed to stop um, you know, uh, ecological catastrophe. Uh, and now the question is, how bad are we going to let it get? Um, which means that um, if we're going to meet ecological, uh, you know, well, not exceed ecological limits too much, uh, and at the same time, raise happiness uh, or have better lives. And we've got to have new strategies uh, in a relatively short period of time. And I think uh, unlocking the power of, of citizen science with regard to uh, contemplative science, uh, which is traditionally studied how to be happy uh, without material uh, help, would be incredibly useful. Uh, so there's a case for like, even if you think contemplative science is kind of going to get there eventually, the rate at which we get there is incredibly important at this point in history. So part of what I'm suggesting is that we need to catalyze uh, the studies of uh, well-being as much as we possibly can in citizen sciences. Uh, Liam, and I know you have visuals. Do, I, do you want to show your screen or you prefer to just to... As I said, I'm going to be, okay. Like, okay. I have to modify, we're, we're quite late okay. now. So I'm probably going to be moving through it. So like half the things on this, every slide won't be said. So it'd be probably easier if I just do it like this, if that's okay. Um, I can still read it, because I know your, your slides are good. I'm not saying we're not too pressed on time if necessary. Feel, uh, feel, feel abundance. 
Oh, no, it's fine. I'm, I feel abundant, don't worry. Um, uh, so, okay. So why is citizen science? Um, so why would I say sort of like citizen science, like we kind of know contemplative science and citizen science are, um, might strike people, it might strike people as an odd call that we really need contemplative citizen science because there's a lot of good press that contemplative science gets for involving monks and nuns and the Dalai Lama and so on and so forth. But people who have actually been to a Mind and Life meeting here know that like generally there's few career contemplatives who actually attend these and the people who have had a practice in uh in contemplative science who you know are who are contemplatives often look at the studies that we're doing and are continuing to do and say gee it's kind of lagging behind what we really think is the most important work that we could be doing so it um and this isn't kind of because the people in charge are stupid uh you know francisco varela had a a, a seminal paper in 1996 uh, the solution to the hard problem of consciousness. He then kind of laid out neurophenomenology in this paper as a, a way in which science could be done, um, which would be very different, uh, in which we could sort of match reports, subjective reports of what's going on during meditation with fMRI images of uh, what's going on or any other physiological measure, and notice the link between these two events and use that to sort of create a objective uh, measure of what's subjectively going on. We could now sort of match uh, consciousness and conscious activity to neural events. And then we might be able to create different, more convincing causal stories, right? The, now progress on that has been extremely slow despite the fact that we kind of know what to do. So the last few years, uh, there's been some, some studies that come out doing neurophenomenology, but it wasn't the case that for 20 years uh, that the reason nobody figured out this was a good idea was the reason why uh, not much of it was happening. People knew it was a good idea for, you know, the better part of 20 years while almost nothing was happening. It's because science, you know, the real politic of science is that science goes forward, not at the, space, the, the, the speed of ideas, but kind of at the speed of funding uh, and at a pace determined by kind of the logistical realities of doing science, right? So part of what I would suggest is that what you want to do is to get someone else involved uh, who might be interested in funding uh, scientific studies and who might be interested in releasing practical constraints. One of the most uh, important practical constraints with running any study uh, on meditation, especially one that requires experienced meditators, is the subjects themselves, right? So oftentimes researchers have to go out and uh, acquire subjects every time they want to study, and this takes an enormous amount of time. Uh, so what we would want rather is, is a, a community um, which is engaged, as Mark said, in the process at the deepest level. Right? And part of the reason why um, that might be hard right, is because, you know, though we talk about how science and contemplation have these, you know, these nice overlaps, um, which, is, which is true in a way, there's points of harmony around open-mindedness, a spirit of inquiry, furthering human well-being to some extent. Um, there's also some, some difficulties. Um, for example, what are we trying to do to create predictive theories that explain the world or alleviate suffering? Um, what is the role of intellectual works in the alleviation of suffering? Is it to take, create technologies or drugs that can change the mind? Or is it, as traditionally in, in Buddhist thought has been, has been said, to create rafts to cross the other shore, right? And so part of a big bet that I would suggest for contemplative citizen science is that the citizens, in this case, contemplatives, have for a very long time had precisely criteria which helps to separate the aspects of their tradition, which can be usefully studied, from this as the aspects of 
their tradition, which cannot be usefully studied. And that in fact, part of the reason why it is so difficult for science scientists to engage with contemplatives so far is because there's not a lot of trust in some cases. People, contemplatives are often worried that science is becoming sort of like the voice of contemplation. Um, so, I mean, just an example, Tanya Singer, you know, at some point uh, resigned from Max Planck Institute because she, uh, you know, had difficulty with um, sort of abuse problems in her lab. Uh, and I don't, you know, want to be, this isn't a high circulation talk. I don't, I don't, so I can say that. I don't want to, you know, further complicate her life or anything. But, but at the same time, she was being approached for like uh, speaking engagements about compassion. So like European policymakers were more interested in talking to Tanya Singer about compassion than the, they were to the Dalai Lama uh, shortly before she was removed from the Max Planck Institute uh, for you know, basically a, a, a long pattern of abuse, um, you know, and this is kind of what, what comp contemplatives see and think like, okay, maybe this isn't really a process we want to bring forward. So how does one create a credible contemplative science that contemplatives would actually want to donate to and participate in? Well, sort of citizen science is 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 the answer in many ways. It's going to be my suggestion that if you want to release the institutional constraints of funding and subjects that actually are what have been bringing, keeping contemplative science back for 25 years, uh, then getting citizens uh, motivated is probably the answer, right? Um, and so what I would suggest is that the, the, two, the two truths doctrine of Buddhism, so how many people here are Familiar with the two truths doctrine? Okay, that looks like quite a few people. Okay. Um, so to put it this, this way, so like traditionally, there's been a lot of stuff in, in Buddhism, which we call a raft to cross to the other shore, right? So, um, now, what is a what what is, what is what can you do with a raft? Well, you can you can grasp it, right? You can hold on to a raft for dear life when the waters are raging, uh, kind of. And when we say that we we intellectually get something, we say we grasp it. Okay. And so, relative truths. One way of talking about them are the kinds of truths that are graspable by the intellect. Uh, and ultimate truths are the kinds of things that you only really see if you let go completely uh, of intellectual understanding. And a large part of the most mysterious things, Buddhism, you know, or that people, things that people puzzle over are what would be called uh, ultimate truths. Does that make sense to people a little bit? So uh, can somebody give me an example of like a, maybe an, an ultimate something, something, a teaching of Buddhism, which is more in the uh, area of an ultimate truth. Rufus, do you have a hand up? Yeah, I can put my hand up. Um, well, no, no, for, you know, form is emptiness and emptiness is form or, yeah. Exactly. I have a list of examples. That, that's that's one there. Exactly. Any other ones? I would nominate uh, there is no self. self. Right. Like signlessness. Like, yeah, signlessness. Right. Like, is there is is there literally no self or is that really what we're saying? There's no such thing as a self, right? Whereas there are other aspects or other teachings of Buddhism, which are not so mysterious and actually quite important. Can someone name an example of one of those? 
Okay. I'll Everyone's you... being so shy. I will say the four noble truths are an example of in the kind of historical relative truth. Exactly. So a good Thich Nhat Hanh student, if you read Thich Nhat Hanh, when he, he actually comes and explains like what are what are what is what is the what is historical truth? He uses the example of the four noble truths as Buddha's first teaching, one of his most important teachings, but not his deepest teaching, because they're all basically explained in quite plain language. Life, suffering is part of life. Suffering has roots in particular, attachment and suffering co-arise. He's basically delineating a quite strict relationship between two things. When you have attachment, you will then have suffering. It's almost causal, right? There are ways of ceasing suffering. And then he actually enumerates those this eightfold path, right? So this is an example of a conceptual truth, right? Those are precisely the kinds of truth which could in, in practice be demonstrable, right? So the point is that like, actually the, the tradition already has been for thousands of years separating the parts of its doctrine, which are fundamentally not conceptual and the parts that are, and, the point of the tradition would be like the whole eco like intellectual background of the tradition would say essentially what the intellect can do is demonstrate those kinds of truths and science is all about the intellect. So it's basically quite closely said what kinds of truths are important. And for thousands of years, people have been amassing kind of statements about what types of intellectual truths might be worth proving and are important for ceasing suffering, right? And then there are other things which are these more ultimate dimension things like there is no self, which really all the scientific and study in the world don't particularly help you very much, except if it kind of helps you understand some basic things like attachment is a, you know, is a source of suffering. If we understand that, you might say, okay, I'm getting attached. I should be aware of my attachments, right? These are the kind of conceptual elements of, of Buddhism. Uh, so the idea is that we can actually go through tradition and nominate the things that actually would be scientifically useful. You actually approach Buddhism as a, a potential uh, store of theory or research propositions that actually has the material within it to kind of go in and say which of these are most important. And those in particular, which would be ones, ones which are sort of not demonstrated yet, potentially demonstrated, um, and uh, which are important for suffering. So those are, those are the the basic uh, ideas, right? So like suffering is the four noble truths. Suffering is an innate characteristic of life as normally lived. Pretty much everybody accepts that, right? It wouldn't be very interesting probably to demonstrate that because it's not that novel. It's more of a just something that's difficult to accept. That's where you contemplate suffering. Uh, not because it's not like intellectually interesting, it's just something the mind doesn't really want suffering, right? Whereas attachment and suffering co-arise, that is a lot more controversial, right? The relationship between it. So in that case, that's actually something that isn't at all accepted by uh, science. Another thing would be the possibility of choiceless choice or the, the importance of contemplation itself for um, arriving at ideas. So if you think about the way that we, we break up contemplation, there's, or thought rather, there's thinking fast and thinking slow. And by definition, intuition is fast according to this dichotomy and thinking slow is deliberative and intellectual. Where's contemplation in that dichotomy? It's like the entire, uh, idea of contemplating something and learning about it, not by thinking about it deliberately, but by watching it with an empty mind and seeing what happens, doesn't exist, uh, according to Kahneman and Tversky. 
Uh, that's kind of an oversight. Uh, might be worth running a, running a study on or two. Um, so um, that's to say that there's, there's quite a lot of material. And if we wanted to push forward uh, contemplative science, then identifying those propositions and arranging for them to be studied uh, by by getting uh, funding and subjects from motivated uh, communities of contemplatives would I, I think be best way of building that contemplative science. Does that basically make sense? Okay, so I think I'm at there at that point, because we're running a little bit late, I'll just stop and we could have some questions. Is that work for everybody? Okay. Um, I mean, yeah. what's that? Thank you, Liam. Yeah, thank you, Liam. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I'd, I'd invite, of course, like comments on it, and if spe specifically what things if people have questions about what should be studied from your experience and what you would suggest that would be useful or any other, any other questions. And I posted the link in the chat as well uh, to the slides if people want to actually see. Is it okay, Liam, to share the slides or? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So one of the things if I'm just trying to understand, so in general, common one situation was that we have started to develop science, crowd science, if you like, citizen, you know, large scale citizen science, and that it's also moved to this area which is more uh, rich in not simply just using the crowd to kind of as a kind of resource like Mechanical Turk, but in like active participation. That frames a point, which is that the science of contemplation has not advanced as rapidly or, or as powerfully as we might like. Um, and that this that one of the things I kind of heard maybe alluded to is that partly you, you want to really involve contemplatives who are pretty mature or powerful, they're practicable or, or, or scientists, but the scientific uh, system uh, is a bit antithetical or it's not so conducive to that. It's not so attractive to contemplatives to participate in it as so as much as they want and conversely that all and it also means that there's a tendency for science to kind of confine itself to the shallows of contemplative traditions you know like simple mindfulness but not investigate some of the deeper uh, phenomena and that there's this opportunity by creating an environment where contemplatives are really involved in the scientific process they're not just seen as consultants but real co-creators that we can create a different kind of contemplative science and that one part, Liam, I think you're quite subtly getting at is one of the things is to come up with, as it is as in science, is to come up with good hypotheses tests. And one of them that you're pointing to is to look at the kind of teachings. It could be in any, any tradition, but let's say picking Buddhism. What kind of are some of the deep teachings, like the teaching of non-self in Buddhism, that are amenable to kind of scientific in some way investigation in way and that's that is the first collaborative process would be to be looking at hypotheses that are you i think you mentioned your slides on slide 23 not obvious um so kind of interesting in that way demonstrable but not demonstrated there's kind of amenable to some kind of investigation in a rigorous way i mean not enough like we don't mean fully signing reason but maybe with correlates or other things and important for alleviating suffering or, or making a difference um so is that Am I kind of getting? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Except that, except I wouldn't put non-self on that list. Actually, most of the things which are the deepest teachings, that's a whole, are not particularly amenable to scientific community to scientific study, right? Because you know, do you say there is a self? There is not a self. Evan Thompson, you know, thinks there is a self. Um, you know, he's like one of the the he's like uh, one of the most esteemed people in in mind and life uh because it's essentially like well this the, the point of buddhism isn't that you have a don't have a self or you do have a self it's that you kind of either dimension either way there you you it's not really clear one way or the other whether there's a self we're not literally saying there's no such thing as yourself we're saying essentially it's a construction this thing which you have so deeply reified 
as a self and it made so real is not as real as it seems right but that's not really like a scientific statement whereas right suffering and attachment is a scientific statement right mm -hmm. is in fact a very very direct clear scientific statement that attachment gives rise to suffering um if i could ask a question um one of the things that have kind of or one of the concepts i think that might be useful to kind of consider in this context too um which kind of is somewhere between science and contemplation maybe or kind of this more uh like the statements you could say about the world and like living in the world like something that kind of bridges the two a little bit um is learning um i think science is involved with learning it's like a learning process in a certain way and like buddhism or like the practice of buddhism as it's lived is also a kind of learning um so maybe if you could maybe talk about that a little bit like how science is a kind of learning but also like the more so like absolute truths i guess are also a kind of learning but it's, it's kind of like a different sort of learning it's more like an embodied learning verse or maybe you could say they're embodied in different ways one is embodied in like the scientific process one is embodied in more so like the individual or lived process um maybe if you could talk a little bit about learning across these two kind of um between science and kind of the more lived experience as maybe even it relates to citizen science um that's just kind of the comment or question that i kind of had well mark i don't know i there's so much you could say there um i think that one point definitely saying is that um the, the types of things that we can prove intellectually are more classically learning work versus the, the kinds of truths that we're talking about in is the deepest truths or the, are about unlearning or forgetting many many ways like letting go of something right most of the most of actually what are considered the deepest teachings of Buddhism have a lot to do with what's called the via negativa, essentially letting go of something which seems quite real, like the image of a self, the image of separation, uh, the idea of concepts that are even valid in a way like emptiness is basically that nothing has a self nature, everything is inter is with everything else. Right. Uh, that's kind of, in a way, obvious, uh, but something that we don't see uh, because we get attached to the images of things that um, that makes sense. So I think there's a that's a way in which these two uh, kinds of learning or kinds of knowledge are, are also quite different. Yes, I see Karen, you have to leave. Thanks for the message and we can we can chat again anyway. Yes. Um, I don't know if I want to add something, Matthew, but maybe on the learning aspect. Um, I think it puts into question the uh, it's a bit like, you know, uh, learning a practice. So, so it's different kinds of knowing, right? And and you have kind of the propositional, like the you know, or like a practical knowing, or participatory knowing. And so it's it's the kind of knowing you kind of, um, I would say, uh, would increase, uh, it's a bit different form. So I think in terms, compared to traditional citizen, I would compare it as much as possible, maybe to the citizen science involved in self research for patient communities that have symptoms and they know very well the symptoms. And there is a form of um, uh, learning what works for those. And you have the subjective, the lived experience of kind of like how, how that differs. And, and then you can do this, you can propagate this self research, and other patients with similar symptoms will actually have similar experience. So there's something linked to that. Um, 
uh, maybe that form of learning. I, I don't know if that's what you were going to in terms of the type of knowledge uh, that you learn, but I feel maybe that's kind of like the, the line here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. And also, I see we're actually running uh, very out of time. So I want to say uh, everyone who, who needs to leave now, uh, maybe it gives them a chance to just check out quickly. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, close gong. Is it is it okay if I still ask a, a question? Oh, yes. I mean, at least I can ask a question and you know, yes, whether it's responded now or later. But uh, it's it's maybe more of uh, anyway. Jump, I'll jump to the question on the idea as I think or try to understand um, what the contemplative citizen science, um, the contemplative science that takes. Uh, um, uh, not uh, non-academic practitioners, so experts in their field, um, integrate them into the research process, the formulation of hypotheses and uh, coming up with research protocols, etc. I was thinking of, on the one hand, limitations, but also some benefits uh, of, or certain kind of benefits to the limitations that the academic system, the traditional academic system poses. Mm -hmm as a um uh you know putting up certain kinds of constraints so that um you don't dilute too much the um, um methodolog methodological rigor etc um, of the of the research process but that is an idealistic view it's not always like this <laughs> uh even in you know uh traditional academical uh academic uh, science um, in the ideal case, it might be that, uh, you know, a collaboration just works between at least one scientist or maybe several and at least one contemplative or several to say, ah, I, you know, I experienced this kind of phenomenon. Ah, let's generate this kind of hypothesis out of it. And this is the research protocol, da, 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 collect data. You can falsify it, et cetera. Um, but I am curious. I mean, ideally, this could be a, a beautiful, at least, I don't know how to say it properly, but it would at least be some kind of augmentation of the scientific, the traditional scientific process right? um, by ex exactly not always limited by these constraints and all the funding and, and uh, you know, um, peer review in higher uh, impact journals, etc., limitations that are plaguing uh, academia, um, mainstream academia. But um, okay, that's maybe the idealistic case of how things could work. Um, I, I, I lose a bit the clarity of where I wanted to go with the question, but it's like I'm curious about um, how. How does this, or how can this actually unfold in practice, or where is it already? Like, are there examples where uh, such collaborations are taking place, and how do they compare to, if you will, uh, here's the more you know, sort of mind and life uh, approved and uh, academia approved way of doing a certain kind of research project? Here is a sort of extreme, or as extreme as it gets, contemplative citizen science project. And um, in terms of quality, in terms of uh, what, whatever you can say about the research process and the, the, the I don't know, uh, whatever criteria you could think of uh, about this, mm -hmm. how, do they, how do they compare and what are the like, hopes and pitfalls and dangers to avoid and, and so on, how to make it work in practice. I guess it's a question that everybody shares, <laughs> but uh, I wonder yeah. if there's I mean, some we can... insights already. Yeah, I mean, we can maybe go bring that up. It's because it would be complicated. I've never seen a principled study of, of all of those, right? So you'd have to kind of arrange them properly. Um, I would mean, say just to em emphasize here, right? Like in many ways, what I'm saying is that if you simply get contemplatives to agree in a really principled way, large numbers of contemplatives, this is what the tradition says is worth 
these are the most like these are the statements from tradition that need studying and fund them right that would release a massive amount of constraints and regular science it could be regular scientists doing the work but we all know that like if you if i got re kind of referred to the young leading lights of neurophenomenology four years ago like most of them are out of science right now because there's just not jobs right so the simple thing is like you don't actually need to like do things so differently you need to align people behind hypotheses who realize that those hypotheses are worth studying and funded because right now funding bodies are not allowing things to progress the rates that they you know they need right it's like it is it just there's a myth that science happens because people have ideas and actually science happens because people get money right and it's it's not being funded right so that's kind of you know the, the point here largely uh, but we can talk about that more uh Adisa? uh yeah thank you this has been a really interesting discussion to sort of follow along because there's like different parts of my uh brain that are being kind of lit up by uh, things that are said and i um full disclosure i, I come from the sort of practices and disciplines of you know anti-disciplinarity but also feminist science studies uh and one of the things that i kind of see as like on a meta level happening in this discussion is that um we're, we're kind of seeing disciplinarity and assumptions related to disciplinarity play out as to like who gets to be a contemplative what does citizen science look like what does science look like? What does funding look like? What does infrastructure of research look like? And these are all really valid questions because predominantly most of us work in, in capacities that the bureaucratic hurdles that need to be engaged with in order to do any kind of science is very real and takes up a lot of cognitive energy. Um, and I kind of wonder like, you know, from, from the perspective of like history of knowledge, and that includes in my world, contemplative practices, embodied ways of knowing, tacit knowledge, uh, things that are not written down and, you know, published in journals and things like that. Um, and I think like sometimes, and this is not all the time, but this is just like a personal sort of almost instinct that I have that because of the landscape of research that we're working in contemporarily where innovation is something that is such a buzzword that you always have to come up with new things in order to get funding and creating new frameworks for defining things that are actually quite intuitive and uh like almost like you just know it, it there's a knowing that we kind of tap into that is collectively shared, if not all, but by many people um, at an embodied level, um, that sometimes when we're talking about innovation, it's, it's a lot of reinventing the wheel. Um, and sometimes I think when we're talking about citizen science, not all instances of citizen science are like this, but there are many instances where it can be like this because we already have things like traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, we already have things like, you know, indigenous knowledge and things like that, that were collectively organized into systems and ways of knowing that is quite, you know, useful. Uh, and, and there's also like practices and things and like tips and tricks that we use in our daily lives as to like how to wash certain kinds of clothes. That isn't something that someone perfected at a laboratory. It's just like something that people have worked out and they kind of pass on the skills, right? And when we're thinking about citizen science innovation and gathering funding for research that looks a specific way, oftentimes mm -hmm. uh, we're not really driven by the innate drive to evolve from uh, the level of consciousness. Uh, we're not really driven by the innate um, curiosity that we all possess, but it's actually uh, from almost like a, like a lack-based 
way of approaching the world. What I mean by that is that, you know, as people who live in the current society, we need to make a living. And when our, when we think that resources are drying up, when we think that money is not going to come in, we have to invent a certain kind of new framework for looking at something that is old and there's value in that. But I wonder if contemplative practices of citizen science can contend with that because a lot of ideas about innovation is very oriented and engaged with the framework of uninhibited growth. Uh, whether that's material or intellectual or something else. Um, and growth looks a particular way that is legible to capitalist logics. And I just kind of want to be mindful of that and kind of throw that into the mix. Hmm. Um, that's an interesting one. Um, one thing I'd say, just to maybe I feel a point needs clarifying is a way like I like to think of. Um, so people sometimes say that Gautama spoke in terms of reincarnation because that was the language of his time. And I think I'd be fully on board with the idea that science is the language of now mm. so like if in many ways what we're talking about is simply allowing people to take refuge in practices which have been there for a really long time and so one thing i that i point that i usually emphasize in a longer form of this talk is that mindfulness meditation is basically like a really souped up formal version of my friend tried meditation and it seemed to work for them Right, like we watch people do things, and then causally they seem to kind of get better. And we say, oh, maybe I should try doing that. And that's more or less what mindfulness meditation research is. It's like a, a formalized version of that that's convincing and legitimate in our kind of social discourse uh, that can be produced in the kind of ways that science works. That's been helpful in getting like a lot of people to use traditional knowledge that has been around for a very long time. I wouldn't say it's particularly advanced traditional knowledge. It's a matter of fact, I, mean, I don't know any meditating, meditative scientists who actually choose to take the types of courses that um, you know scientists largely study, which is like MBSR, like the Kabat-Zinn courses. Nobody, I don't know anybody who actually does that as their regular practice, which sort of says that they don't really believe that the form of meditative practice that they mainly study is superior mm. to what wasn't studied. Uh, however, some of the kind of main commitments, like just doing mindfulness practice uh, of the traditional work has been kind of reified, you could say wholesomely reified by science, which is essentially the point of the scientific program is to yeah wholesome reification so and there's nothing actually in you know traditional speak it's like there's you can wholesomely reify certain things that's essentially what a, the rafts of the tradition are it's like things that are open, that will are helpful to actually reify for a point uh and, and it will help you kind of get across to the other side where you can then let go of them um so maybe that's helpful as a yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I'm just like kind of sitting with all of this, right? Um, I've not really come across this particular intersection. Uh, and I feel like there's like things that are kind of still percolating because I come from a different um, training. Um, and, and you know, every, a lot of stuff that I'm saying today would be considered blasphemous to my training, uh, my early training, especially because I studied engineering. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm also trying to finish up a PhD. So there's a lot of questions up in the air and um, I, I'm kind of rolling with um, what comes up. But yeah, I think like one of the things that I do really love about the 
I don't even want to say like resurgence because I think people have been doing mindfulness practices in different ways without realizing they were doing mindfulness practices, but the sort of formalization and, and the sort of identification of them uh, is that uh, we're giving credence to ways of knowing that may have been not acknowledged and respected. And I think there's value in that. So. Yeah, yeah. It's a, I would should say that the oh, that's another, so thanks for that comment. And actually it alludes to another point, which I think is maybe one of the most important reasons why contemplative citizen science, which is that if contemplatives are helping to direct science, it also gives the platform to speak on what science can't prove or can't show. So all of the stuff that I you know, was talking about, what science can't show, is actually more important in many ways than what it can show because it points to the limits of knowledge. Uh, and so it's kind of using the credibility that comes from engagement in the scientific process and showing that you can contribute to it, I think potentially can give the chance to draw the limits of the scientific process, which really like seriously needs to be done. Uh, absolutely. Um, and and, and absol uh, like the thing is that I, I feel that I often sit at that sort of very confusing and often uncomfortable intersection between science and rationality and spirituality. Um, and I've, I have my own sort of personal experiences that inform um, the ways that I look at that um, all of those things as like silos, even though I'm trying to rise above disciplinarity. Um, and yeah, I think this is this is pretty cool. All right. uh, I think we're getting pretty our past time, but Matt, you had one more, or do we have to go? Yeah, I'll be quick too. I think I just wanted to emphasize that point there that, and I think like, especially when getting contemplatives involved, they might have this idea that like science is always trying to prove something, but I think it is so important to prove that there are, or to point out that there are things that science uh, has a lot of trouble proving or even can prove. And I think like when starting these conversations with the collaborative citizen science, um, especially with people who are kind of dedicate their lives to that uncertainty. It's like so important to say in the beginning, like science can only do so much or like we can only do so much, like we can only answer these kinds of questions maybe. So I think as emphasizing that, I think uh, is- oh, really Trust me, if I'm, if I'm presenting to contemplatives, that's probably the first thing I say. Yeah, yeah that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> they definitely want to hear that. Mm-hmm.